Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and enjoy your audiobook. Chapter 4 Tricky Woo A Triumph of Surgery I was really worried about Tricky this time. I had pulled out my car when I saw him in the street with his mistress, and I was shocked at his appearance. He had become hugely fat, like a bloated sausage with a little leg at each corner. His eyes, bloodshot and roomy, stood straight ahead, and his tongue lolled from his jaws. Mrs. Pumphrey hastened to explain. He was so listless, Mr. Herriot. He seemed to have no energy. I thought he must be suffering from malnutrition, so I... I've been giving him some little extras between meals to build him up. Some calf's foot jelly and molten cod liver oil and a bowl of Horlicks each night to make him sleep. Nothing much, really. And did you cut down on the sweet things as I told you? Oh, I did for a bit, but he seemed to be so weak. I had to relent. He does love cream cakes and chocolate, so I can't bear to refuse him. I looked down again at the little dog. That was the trouble. Tricky's only fault was greed. He had never been known to refuse food. He would tackle the meal at any hour of the day or night. And I wondered about all the things Mrs. Pumphrey hadn't mentioned. The pate on thin biscuits, the fudge, the rich trifles. Tricky loved them all. I tried to sound severe. Now, I really mean this. If you don't cut his food right down and give him more exercise, he is going to be really ill. You must harden your heart and keep him on a very strict diet. Mrs. Pumphrey wrung her hands. Oh, I will, Mr. Harriet. I'm, I'm sure you're right, but it is so difficult, so very difficult. She set off head down along the road, as if determined to put the new regime into practice immediately. I watched their progress with growing concern. Tricky was tottering along in his little tweed coat. He had a whole wardrobe of these coats, warm tweed or tartan ones for the cold weather, and mackintoshes for the wet days. He struggled on, drooping in his harness. I thought it wouldn't be long before I heard from Mrs. Pumphrey. The expected call came within a few days. Mrs. Pumphrey was distraught. Tricky would eat nothing, refused even his favourite dishes, and besides, he had bouts of vomiting. He spent all his time lying on a rug, panting, didn't go for walks, didn't want to do anything. I had made my plans in advance. The only way was to get Tricky out of the house for a period. I suggested that he be hospitalised for about a fortnight to be kept under observation. The poor lady almost swooned. She had never been separated from her darling before. She was sure he would pine and die if he didn't see her every day. But I took a firm line. Tricky was very ill, and this was the only way to save him. In fact, I thought it best to take him away without delay, and, followed by Mrs. Pumphrey's wailings, I marched out to the car, carrying the little dog wrapped in a blanket. The entire staff were roused, and maids rushed in and out, bringing his bed, favourite cushions, toys and rubber rings, breakfast bowl, lunch bowl, supper bowl. Realising that my car would never hold all the stuff, I started to drive away. As I moved off, Mrs. Pumphrey, with a despairing cry, threw an armful of little coats through the window. I looked in the mirror before I turned the corner of the drive. Everybody was in tears. Out on the road, I glanced down at the pathetic little animal gasping on the seat by my side. I patted the head and Tricky made a brave effort to wag his tail. Poor old lad, I said. You haven't a kick in you, but I think I know the cure for you. At the surgery, the household dog surged around me. Tricky looked down at the noisy pack with dull eyes, and when put down, lay motionless on the carpet. The other dogs, after sniffing round him for a few seconds, decided he was an uninteresting object and ignored him. I made up a bed for him in a warm loose box next to the one where the other dog slept. For two days I kept an eye on him, giving him no food but plenty of water. At the end of the second day, he started to show some interest in his surroundings, and on the third, he began to whimper when he heard the dogs in the yard. When I opened the door, Tricky trotted out and was immediately engulfed by Joe the Greyhound and his friends. After rolling him over and thoroughly inspecting him, the dogs moved off down the garden. 
Tricky followed them, rolling slightly with his surplus fat, but obviously intrigued. Later that day, I was present at feeding time. I watched while Tristan slopped the food into the bowls. There was the usual headlong rush followed by the sounds of high-speed eating. Every dog knew that if he fell behind the others, he was liable to have some competition for the last part of his meal. When they had finished, Tricky took a walk round the shining bowls, licking casually inside one or two of them. Next day, an extra bowl was put out for him, and I was pleased to see him jostling his way towards it. From then on, his progress was rapid. He had no medicinal treatment of any kind, but all day he ran about with the dogs, joining in their friendly scrimmages. He discovered the joys of being bowled over, trampled on and squashed every few minutes. He became an accepted member of the gang, an unlikely, silky little object among the shaggy crew, fighting like a tiger that he shared at mealtimes and hunting rats in the old henhouse at night. He had never had such a time in his life. All the while, Mrs. Pumphrey hovered anxiously in the background, ringing a dozen times a day for the latest bulletins. I dodged the questions about whether his cushions were being turned regularly or his correct coat worn, according to the weather, but I was able to tell her that the little fellow was out of danger and convalescing rapidly. The word convalescing seemed to do something to Mrs. Pumphrey. She started to bring round fresh eggs, two dozen at a time to build up Tricky's strength. For a happy period, there were two eggs each for breakfast. But when the bottles of sherry began to arrive, the real possibilities of the situation began to dawn on the household. It was the same delicious vintage that I knew so well, and it was to enrich Tricky's blood. Lunch became a ceremonial occasion with two glasses before and several during the meal. Siegfried and Tristan took turns at proposing Tricky's health, and the standard of speech-making improved daily. As the sponsor, I was always called upon to reply. We could hardly believe it when the brandy came. Two bottles of Cordon Bleu, intended to put a final edge on Tricky's constitution. Siegfried dug out some balloon glasses belonging to his mother. I had never seen them before, but for a few nights they saw constant service as the fine spirit was rolled around, inhaled, and reverently drunk. They were days of deep content. Starting well with the extra egg in the morning, bolstered up and sustained by the midday sherry, and finishing luxuriously around the fire with the brandy. It was a temptation to keep Tricky on as a permanent guest, but I knew Mrs. Pumphrey was suffering, and after a fortnight felt compelled to phone and tell her that the little dog had recovered and was awaiting collection. Within minutes, about thirty feet of gleaming black metal drew up outside the surgery. The chauffeur opened the door, and I could just make out the figure of Mrs. Pumphrey almost lost in the interior. Her hands were tightly clasped in front of her. Her lips trembled. Oh, Mr. Harriet, do tell me the truth. Is he really better? Yes, he's fine. There is no need for you to get out of the car. I'll go and fetch him. I walked through the house and into the garden. A mass of dogs was hurtling round and round the lawn, and in their midst, ears flapping, tail waving, was the little golden figure of Tricky. In two weeks he had been transformed into a lithe, hard-muscled animal. He was keeping out well with the pack, stretching out in great bounds, his chest almost brushing the ground. I carried him back along the passage to the front of the house. The chauffeur was still holding the car door open, and when Tricky saw his mistress he took off from my arms in a tremendous leap and sailed into Mrs. Pumphrey's lap. She gave a startled, Oh! and then had to defend herself as he swarmed over her, licking her face and barking. During the excitement, I helped the chauffeur to bring out the beds, toys, cushions, coats and bowls, none of which had been used. As the car moved away, Mrs. Pumphrey leant out of the window. Tears shone in her eyes. Her lips trembled. Oh, Mr. Harriet, she cried. How can I ever thank you? This is a triumph of surgery. Chapter 5 Jake rides into town. I suppose it isn't unusual to see a man pushing a pram in a town, but on a lonely moorland road, the sight merits a second glance, especially when the pram contains a large dog. That was what I saw in the hills above Darraby one morning, and I slowed down as I drove past. I had noticed the strange combination before, 
on several occasions over the last few weeks, and it was clear that man and dog had recently moved into the district. As the car drew abreast of him, the man turned, smiled, and raised his hand. It was a smile of rare sweetness in a very brown face. A forty-year-old face, I thought, above a brown neck which bore neither collar nor tie, and a faded, striped shirt lying open over a bare chest despite the coldness of the day. I couldn't help wondering who or what he was. The outfit of scuffed suede golf jacket, corduroy trousers, and mighty sturdy boots didn't give much clue. Some people might have put him down as an ordinary tramp, but there was a businesslike, energetic look about him which didn't quite fit the term. I wound the window down, and the thin wind of the Yorkshire March bit at my cheeks. Nippy this morning, I said. The man seemed surprised. I, he replied after a moment. I, reckon it is. I looked at the pram, ancient and rusty. And at the big animal sitting upright inside it, he was a lurcher, a crossbred greyhound, and he gazed back at me with unruffled dignity. "Nice dog," I said. "Aye, that's Jake." The man smiled again, showing good regular teeth. "He's a grandon." I waved and drove on. In the mirror, I could see the compact figure stepping out briskly, head up, shoulders squared, and rising like a statue from the middle of the pram. The huge, brindled form of Jake. I didn't have to wait long to meet the unlikely pair again. I was examining a cart horse's teeth in a farmyard when, on the hillside beyond the stable, I saw a figure kneeling by a dry stone wall, and by his side a pram and a big dog sitting patiently on the grass. Hey, just a minute! I pointed at the hill. Who is that? The farmer laughed. <laughs> That's Roddy Travers. Do you get him? No, no, I don't. I had a word with him on the road the other day. That's all. Aye, on the road. He nodded knowingly. That's where you'd see Roddy right enough. But what is he? Where does he come from? He comes from somewhere in Yorkshire, but I don't rightly know where, and I don't think anybody else does. But I'll tell you this: he can turn his hand to anything. Yes. I said, watching the man expertly laying the flat slabs of stone as he repaired a gap in the wall. There's not many men can do what he's doing now. That's true. Walling is a skilled job, and it's dying out. But Roddy's a dab hand at it. But he can do out edging, ditching, looking at the stock. It's all the same to him. I lifted the tooth rasp and began to rub a few sharp corners off the horse's molars. And how long will he stay here? Oh, when he's finished that wall, he'll be off. I could do with him stopping around for a bit, but he never stays in one place for long. But hasn't he got a home anywhere? Nay, nay! The farmer laughed again. Roddy's gotten out. All he has in the world is in that there pram. Over the next weeks, as the harsh spring began to soften, and the sunshine brought a bright speckle of primroses onto the grassy banks, I saw Roddy quite often. Sometimes on the road, occasionally wielding a spade busily on the ditches around the fields. Jake was always there, either loping by his side or watching him at work. But we didn't actually meet again till I was inoculating Mister Porson's sheep. There were three hundred to do, and they drove them in batches into a small pen where Roddy caught and held them for me. And I could see he was an expert at this too. The wild hill sheep whipped past him like bullets, but he seized their fleece effortlessly, sometimes in mid-air, and held the foreleg up to expose that bare, clean area of skin behind the elbow that nature seemed to provide for the veterinary surgeon's needle. Outside, on the windy slopes, the big lurcher sat upright in typical pose, looking with mild interest at the farm dogs prowling intently around the pens, but not interfering in any way. "You've got him well trained," I said. Roddy smiled. "Yes, you'll never find Jake dashing about annoying people. He knows he has to sit there till I'm finished, and there he'll sit. And quite happy to do so by the look of him." I glanced again at the dog, a picture of contentment. He must live a wonderful life traveling everywhere with you. You're right there, Mister Porson broke in as he ushered another bunch of sheep into the pen. He hasn't a care in world, just like his master. Roddy didn't say anything, but as the sheep ran in, he straightened up and took a long, steady breath. He had been working hard, and a little trickle of sweat ran down the side of his forehead. But as he gazed over the wide sweep of moor and fell, I could read utter serenity in his face.
After a few moments, he spoke. I reckon that's true. We haven't much to worry us, Jake and me. Mr. Pawson grinned mischievously. By go, Roddy, you've never spoke a truer word. No wife, no kids, no life insurance, no overdraft at bank. You must have a right peaceful existence. I suppose so, Roddy said. But then I have no money either. The farmer gave him a quizzical look. Aye, how about that then? Wouldn't you feel a bit more secure like if you had a bit of brass put by? Nay, nay, you can't take it with you. In any world, as long as a man can pay his way, he's got enough. There was nothing original about the words, but they have stayed with me all my life because they came from his lips and were spoken with such profound assurance. When I had finished the inoculations and the ewes were turned out to trot back happily over the open fields, I turned to Roddy. Well, thanks very much. It makes my job a lot quicker when I have a good catcher like you. I pulled out a packet of gold flake. Will you have a cigarette? No, thank you, Miss Harriet. I don't smoke. You don't? No. Don't drink either. He gave me his gentle smile, and again I had the impression of physical and mental purity. No drinking, no smoking, a life of constant movement in the open air without material possessions or ambitions. It all showed in the unclouded eyes, the fresh skin and the hard, muscular frame. He wasn't very big, but he looked indestructible. Come on, Jake, it's dinner time, he said, and the big lurcher bounded around him in delight. I went over and spoke to the dog, and he responded with tremendous body-swaying wags, his handsome face looking up at me full of friendliness. I stroked the long, pointed head and tickled the ears. He's a beauty, Ronnie. A grandin, as you said. I walked to the house to wash my hands, and before I went inside, I glanced back at the two of them. They were sitting in the shelter of a wall, and Roddy was laying out a thermos flask and a parcel of food while Jake watched eagerly. The hard, bright sunshine beat on them as the wind whistled over the top of the wall. They looked supremely comfortable and at peace. He's independent, you see, the farmer's wife said as I stood at the kitchen sink. He's welcome to come in for a bit of dinner, but he'd rather stay outside with his dog. I nodded. Where does he sleep when he's going round the farms like this? Oh, anywhere, she replied. In hay barns or granaries or sometimes out in the open. But when he's with us, he sleeps upstairs in one of our rooms. I know for a fact any of the farmers will be willing to have him in the house because he always keeps himself spotless clean. I see. I pulled the towel from behind the door. He's quite a character, isn't he? She smiled, ruminatively. Aye, he certainly is. Just him and his dog. She lifted a fragrant dishful of hot roast ham from the oven and set it on the table. But I'll tell you this. The fella's all right. Everybody likes Roddy Travers. He's a very nice man. Roddy stayed around the Dalaby district throughout the summer, and I grew used to the sight of him on the farms or pushing his pram along the roads. When it was raining, he wore a tattered, overlong gabardine coat, but at other times it was always the golf jacket and corduroys. I don't know where he had accumulated his wardrobe. It was a safe bet he had never been on a golf course in his life. I saw him early one morning on a hill path in early October. It had been a night of iron frost, and the tussocky pastures beyond the walls were held in a pitiless white grip, with every blade of grass stiffly ensheathed in rime. I was muffled to the eyes and had been beating my gloved fingers against my knees to thaw them out, but when I pulled up and wound down the window, the first thing I saw was the bare chest under the collarless, unbuttoned shirt. "'Morning, Mr. Harriet, he said. "'I'm glad I've seen you.' He paused and gave me his tranquil smile. There's a job along road for a couple of weeks, then I'm moving on. I see. I knew enough about him now not to ask where he was going. Instead, I looked down at Jake, who was sniffling the herbage. I see he's walking this morning. Roddy laughed. Yes, yeah, sometimes he likes to walk, sometimes he likes to ride. He pleases himself. Right, Roddy, I said. No doubt we'll meet again. All the best to you. He waved and set off jauntily over the ice-bound road, and I felt that a little vein of richness had gone from my life. But I was wrong. 
That same evening, about eight o'clock, the doorbell rang. I answered it and found Roddy on the front doorstep. Behind him, just visible in the frosty darkness, stood the ubiquitous pram. I want you to look at me dog, Mr. Elliot, he said. Why? What's the trouble? I don't rightly know. He's having sort of fainting fits. Fainting fits? That doesn't sound like Jake. Where is he anyway? He pointed behind him. In pram, under cover. All right. I threw the door wide open. Bring him in. Roddy adroitly manhandled the rusty old vehicle up the steps and pushed it, squeaking and rattling along the passage to the consulting room. There, under the bright lights, he snapped back the fasteners and threw off the cover to reveal Jake stretched beneath. His head was pillowed on the familiar gabardine coat, and around him lay his master's worldly goods. A string-tied bundle of spare shirt and socks, a packet of tea, a thermos, knife and spoon, and an ex-army haversack. The big dog looked up at me with terrified eyes, and as I patted him I could feel his whole frame quivering. Let him lie there a minute, Roddy, I said, and tell me exactly what you've seen. He rubbed his palms together, and his fingers trembled. Well, it only started this afternoon. He was right as rain, larking about on the grass. Then he went into a sort of fit. How do you mean? Just kind of seized up and toppled over on his side. He lay there for a bit, gasping and slavering. I tell you, I thought he was a goner. His eyes widened and a corner of his mouth twitched at the memory. How long did that last? Not but a few seconds. Then he got up, and you'd say there was nothing wrong with him. But he did it again. Aye, time and time again. Drove me near daft. But in between, he was normal. Normal, Mr. Elliot. It sounded ominously like the onset of epilepsy. How old is he? I asked. Five, gone last February. Ah, well... It was a bit old for that. I reached for a stethoscope and auscultated the heart. I listened intently but heard only the racing beat of a frightened animal. There was no abnormality. My thermometer showed no rise in temperature. Let's have him on the table, Roddy. You take the back end. The big animal was limp in our arms as we hoisted him onto the smooth surface. But after lying there for a moment, he looked timidly around him, then sat up with a slow and careful movement. As we watched, he reached out and licked his master's face while his tail flickered between his legs. Look at that, the man exclaimed. He's all right again. You'd think he didn't ail a thing. And indeed, Jake was recovering his confidence rapidly. He peered tentatively at the floor a few times, then suddenly jumped down, trotted to his master, and put his paws against his chest. I looked at the dog standing there, tail wagging furiously. Well, that's a relief anyway. I didn't like the look of him just then, but whatever's been troubling him seems to have righted itself. I'll... My happy flow was cut off. I stared at the lurcher. His forelegs were on the floor again, and his mouth was gaping as he fought for breath. Frantically, he gasped and retched as he blundered across the floor, collided with the pram wheels, and fell on his side. What the hell... Quick, get him up again. I grabbed the animal round the middle and we lifted him back onto the table. I watched in disbelief as the huge form lay there. There was no fight for breath now. He wasn't breathing at all. He was unconscious. I pushed my fingers inside his thigh and felt the pulse. It was still going, rapid and feeble, but yet he didn't breathe. He could die any moment and I stood there helpless, all my scientific training useless. Finally, my frustration burst from me, and I struck the dog on the ribs with the flat of my hand. Jake! I yelled. Jake, what's the matter with you? As though in reply, the lurcher immediately started to take great wheezing breaths. His eyelids twitched back to consciousness, and he began to look about him. But he was still mortally afraid, and he lay prone as I gently stroked his head. There was a long silence while the animal's terror slowly subsided. Then he sat up on the table and regarded us placidly. There you are, Roddy said softly. Same thing again. I can't reckon it up, and I thought I knew something about dogs. I didn't say anything. I couldn't reckon it up either, and I was supposed to be a veterinary surgeon. I spoke at last. Roddy, that wasn't a fit. He was choking. Something was interfering with his airflow. I took my hand torch from my breast pocket. 
I'm going to have a look at his throat. I pushed Jake's jaws apart, depressing his tongue with a forefinger, and shone the light into the depths. He was the kind of good-natured dog who offered no resistance as I prodded around, but despite my floodlit view of the pharynx, I could find nothing wrong. I'd been hoping desperately to come across a bit of bone stuck there somewhere, but I ranged feverishly over pink tongue, healthy tonsils, and gleaming molars without success. Everything looked perfect. I was tilting his head a little further when I felt him stiffen and heard Roddy's cry. He's gone again! And he was, too. I stared in horror as the brindled body slid away from me and lay prostrate once more on the table, and again the mouth strained wide and froth bubbled round the lips. As before, the breathing had stopped and the ribcage was motionless. As the seconds ticked away, I beat on the chest with my hand, but it didn't work this time. I pulled the lower eyelid down from the staring orb. The conjunctiva was blue. Jake hadn't long to live. The tragedy of the thing bore down on me. This wasn't just a dog. He was this man's family, and I was watching him die. It was at that moment that I heard the faint sound. It was a strangled cough which barely stirred the dog's lips. Damn it! I shouted. He is choking! There must be something down there! Again I seized the head and pushed my torch into the mouth, and I shall always be thankful that at that very instant the dog coughed again, opening the cartilages of the larynx and giving me a glimpse of the cause of all the trouble. There, beyond the drooping epiglottis, I saw for a fleeting moment a smooth, round object no bigger than a pea. I think it's a pebble, I gasped, right inside his larynx. You mean in his Adam's apple? That's right, and it's acting like a ball valve blocking his windpipe every now and then. I shook the dog's head. You see, look, I dislodged it for the moment. He's coming round again. Once more, Jake was reviving and breathing steadily. Roddy ran his hand over the head, along the back and down the great muscles of the hind limbs. But, but, it'll happen again, won't it? I nodded. I'm afraid so. And one of these times it isn't going to shift and that'll be the end of him. He had gone very pale. That's about it, Roddy. I'll have to get that pebble out. But how? Cut into the larynx. And right now it's the only way. All right. He swallowed. Let's get on. I don't think I could stand it if he went down again. I knew what he meant. My knees had begun to shake and I had a strong conviction that if Jake collapsed once more, then so would I. I seized a pair of scissors and clipped away the hair from the ventral surface of the larynx. I dared not use a general anaesthetic, and infiltrated the area with local before swabbing with antiseptic. Mercifully, there was a freshly boiled set of instruments lying in the sterilizer, and I lifted out the tray and set it on the trolley by the side of the table. Hold his head steady, I said hoarsely, and gripped a scalpel. I cut down through skin, fascia, and the thin layers of muscles, till the ventral surface of the larynx was revealed. This was something I'd never done to a live dog before, but desperation abolished any hesitancy, and it took me only another few seconds to incise the thin membrane and peer into the interior. And there it was. A pebble right enough, grey and glistening and tiny, but big enough to kill. I had to fish it out quickly and cleanly, without pushing it into the trachea. I leant back and rummaged in the tray till I found some broad-bladed forceps, then I poised them over the wound. Great surgeon's hands, I felt sure, didn't shake like this. Nor did such men pant as I was doing. But I clenched my teeth, introduced the forceps, and my hand magically steadied as I clamped them over the pebble. I stopped panting, too. In fact, I didn't breathe at all as I bore the shining little object slowly and tenderly through the opening, and dropped it with a gentle rat-tat on the table. Is that it? asked Roddy, almost in a whisper. That's it. I reached for a needle and suture silk. All is well now. The stitching took only a few minutes, and by the end of it Jake was bright-eyed and alert, paws shifting impatiently, ready for anything. He seemed to know his troubles were over. Roddy brought him back in ten days to have the stitches removed. It was, in fact, the very morning he was leaving the Darabee district, and after I had picked the few loops of silk from the nicely healed wound, I walked with him to the front door while Jake capered round our feet. 
On the pavement outside Skeldell House, the ancient pram stood in all its high, rusty dignity. Roddy pulled back the cover. Up, oh, boy, he murmured, and the big dog leapt effortlessly into his accustomed place. Roddy took hold of the handle with both hands, and as the autumn sunshine broke suddenly through the clouds, it lit up a picture which had grown familiar and part of a daily scene. The open shirt and brown chest, the handsome animal sitting up looking around him with natural grace. Well, so long, Roddy, I said. I suppose you'll be around these parts again. He turned, and I saw that smile again. Aye, reckon I'll be back. He gave a push, and they were off. The strange vehicle creaking, Jake swaying gently as they went down the street. The memory came back to me of what I had seen under the cover that night in the surgery. The haversack, which would contain his razor, towel, soap, and a few other things. The packet of tea in the thermos. And something else. A tiny dog collar. Could it have belonged to Jake as a pup, or to another loved animal? It added a little more mystery to the man. And explained other things, too. The farmer had been right. All Roddy possessed was in that pram. And it seemed it was all he desired, too. Because as he turned the corner and disappeared from my view, I could hear him whistling. Chapter 6 Jip, Only One Woof Is this the thing you've been telling me about? I asked. Mr. Wilkin nodded. Aye, that's it. It's always like that. I looked down at the helpless convulsions of the big dog lying at my feet, at the staring eyes, the wildly peddling limbs. The farmer had told me about the periodic attacks which had begun to affect his sheepdog, Jip, but it was coincidence that one should occur when I was on the farm for another reason. And he's all right afterwards, you say? Right as a bobbin. Seems a bit dazed, maybe, for about an hour, then he's back to normal. The farmer shrugged. I've had lots of dogs through my hands, as you know, and I've seen plenty of dogs with fits. I thought I knew all the causes, worms, wrong feeding, distemper, but this has me beat. I've tried everything. Well, you can stop trying, Mr. Wilkin, I said. You won't be able to do much for Jib. He's got epilepsy. Epilepsy? But he's a grand normal dog most of the time. Yes, I know, that's how it goes. There's nothing actually wrong with his brain. It's a mysterious condition. The cause is unknown, but it's almost certainly hereditary. Mr. Wilkin raised his eyebrows. Well, that's a rumen. If it's hereditary, why hasn't it shown up before now? He's nearly two years old, and he didn't start this till a few weeks ago. That's typical, I replied. Eighteen months to two years is about the time it usually appears. Jip interrupted us by getting up and staggering towards his master, wagging his tail. He seemed untroubled by his experience. In fact, the whole thing had lasted less than two minutes. Mr. Wilkin bent and stroked the rough head briefly. His craggy features were set in a thoughtful cast. He was a big, powerful man in his forties, and now, as the eyes narrowed in the face that really smiled, he looked almost menacing. I had heard more than one man say he wouldn't like to get on the wrong side of Sepp Wilkin, and I could see what they meant. But he had always treated me right, and since he farmed nearly a thousand acres, I saw quite a lot of him. His passion was sheepdogs. A lot of farmers like to run dogs at the trials, but Mr. Wilkin was one of the top men. He bred and trained dogs, which regularly won at the local events, and occasionally at the national trials. And what was troubling me was that Jip was his main hope. He had picked out the best two pups from a litter, Jip and Sweep and had trained them with a dedication that had made him a winner. I don't think I've ever seen two dogs enjoy each other quite so much. Whenever I was on the farm, I could see them together, sometimes peeping nose by nose over the half-door of the loose box where they slept, occasionally slinking devotedly round the feet of their master, but usually just playing together. They must have spent hours rolling about in ecstatic wrestling matches, growling and panting, gnawing gently at each other's limbs. A few months ago, George Crossley, one of Mr. Wilkins' oldest friends and a keen trial man, had lost his best dog with nephritis, and Mr. Wilkin had let him have Sweep. I was surprised at the time, because Sweep was shaping better than Jip in his training, and looked like turning out a real champion. But it was Jip who remained. He must have missed his friend, but there were other dogs on the farm, and if they didn't quite make up for Sweep, he was never really lonely. 
As I watched, I could see the dog recovering rapidly. It was extraordinary how soon normality was restored after that frightening convulsion, and I waited with some apprehension to hear what his master would say. The cold, logical decision for him to make would be to have Jip put down, and looking at the friendly, tail-wagging animal, I didn't like the idea at all. There was something very attractive about him. The big-boned, well-marked body was handsome, but his most distinctive feature was his head, where one ear somehow contrived to stick up while the other lay flat, giving him a lopsided comic appeal. Jip, in fact, looked a bit of a clown, but a clown who radiated goodwill and camaraderie. Mr. Wilkins spoke at last. Will he get any better as he grows older? Almost certainly not, I replied. Then he'll always have these fits. I'm afraid so. You say he has them every two or three weeks. Well, it will probably carry on more or less like that, with occasional variations. But he could have one any time. Yes. In the middle of a trial, like. The farmer sunk his head on his chest and his voice rumbled deep. Well, that's it, then. In the long silence which followed, the fateful words became more and more inevitable. Sepp Wilkin wasn't the man to hesitate in a matter which concerned his ruling passion. Ruthless culling of any animal which didn't come up to standard would be his policy. When he finally cleared his throat, I had a sinking premonition of what he was going to say. But I was wrong. If I kept him, could you do anything for him? he asked. Well, I could give you some pills for him. They might decrease the frequency of the fits. I tried to keep the eagerness out of my voice. Right. Right, I'll come into surgery and get some, he muttered. Fine, but, um, you won't ever breed from him, will you? I said. No, no, no. The farmer grunted with a touch of irritability as though he didn't want to pursue the matter further. And I held my peace because I felt intuitively that he did not want to be detected in a weakness that he was prepared to keep the dog simply as a pet. It was funny how events began to slot into place and suddenly make sense. That was why he had let Sweep, the superior dog, go. He just liked Jip. In fact, Sepp Wilkin, hard man though he may be, had succumbed to that offbeat charm. So I shifted to some light chatter about the weather as I walked back to the car, but when I was about to drive off, the farmer turned to the main subject. There's one thing about Jip I never mentioned, he said, bending to the window. I don't know whether it was out to do with a job or not. He has never barked in his life. I looked at him in surprise. You mean never, ever? That's right, not a single bark. Two the dogs make a noise when strangers come onto the farm, but I've never heard Jip utter a sound since he was born. Well, that's very strange, I said. But I can't see that it is connected with his condition in any way. And as I switched on the engine, I noticed for the first time that while a bitch and two half-grown pups gave tongue to see me on my way, Jip merely regarded me in his comradely way, mouth open, tongue lolling, but made no noise. A silent dog. The thing intrigued me. So much so that whenever I was on the farm over the next few months, I made a point of watching the big sheepdog at whatever he was doing. But there was never any change. Between the convulsions, which had settled down to around three week intervals, he was a normal, active, happy animal, but soundless. I saw him too in Darby when his master came into market. Jip was often seated comfortably in the back of the car, but if I happened to speak to Mr. Wilkin on these occasions, I kept off the subject because, as I said, I had the feeling that he, more than most farmers, would hate to be exposed in keeping a dog for more than working purposes. And yet I have always entertained a suspicion that most farm dogs are more or less pets. The dogs on sheep farms were, of course, indispensable working animals, and on other establishments they no doubt performed a function in helping to bring in the cows. But watching them on my daily rounds, I often wondered. I saw them rocking along on carts at haytime, 
chasing rats among the stooks at harvest, pottering around the buildings or roaming the fields at the side of the farmer. And I wondered, what did they really do? I still stick to my theory. Most farm dogs are pets, and they are there mainly because the farmer just likes to have them around. You would have to put a farmer on the rack to get him to admit it, but I think I'm right. And in the process, those dogs have a wonderful time. They don't have to beg for walks, they are out all day long and in the company of their masters. If I want to find a man on a farm, I look for his dog, knowing the man won't be far away. I try to give my own dogs a good life, but it cannot compare with the life of the average farm dog. There was a long spell when Sep Wilkins' stock stayed healthy, and I didn't see either him or Jip. Then I came across them both by accident at a sheepdog trial. It was a local event in conjunction with the Mellerton Agricultural Show. I took Helen with me too, because these trials have always fascinated us. The wonderful control of the owners over their animals, the intense involvement of the dogs themselves, the sheer skill of the whole operation has always held us spellbound. She put her arm through mine as we went in at the entrance gate to where a crescent of cars was drawn up at one end of a long field. The field was on the river's edge, and through a fringe of trees the afternoon sunshine glinted on the tumbling water of the shallows and turned the long beach of bleached stones to a dazzling white. Groups of men, mainly competitors, stood around chatting as they watched. They were quiet, easy, bronzed men, and as they seemed to be drawn from all social strata, from prosperous farmers to working men, their garb was varied. Cloth caps, trilbies, deer stalkers, or no hat at all. Tweed jackets, stiff, best suits, open neck shirts, fancy ties, sometimes neither collar nor tie. Nearly all of them leant on long crooks with the handles fashioned from ram's horns. Snatches of talk reached us as we walked among them. You got here then, Fred? Ah, oh, that's a good gavvy. Nay, is Miss Warnie'll get out for that. Them sheets a bit flighty. Aye, they're buggers. And above it all, the whistles of the man running a dog. Every conceivable level and pitch of whistle, with now and then a shout, Sit! Get by! Every man had his own way with his dog. The dogs waiting their turn were tied up to a fence with a hedge growing over it. There were about seventy of them, and it was rather wonderful to see that long row of waving tails and friendly expressions. They were mostly strangers to each other, but there wasn't even the semblance of disagreement, never mind a fight. It seemed that the natural obedience of these little creatures was linked to an amicable disposition. This appeared to be common to their owners, too. There was no animosity, no resentment at defeat, no unseemly display of triumph in victory. If a man overran his time, he ushered his group of sheep quietly in the corner and returned with a philosophical grin to his colleagues. There was a little quiet leg-pulling, but that was all. We came across Sep Wilkin leaning against his car at the best vantage point about thirty yards away from the final pen. Jip, tied to the bumper, turned and gave me his crooked grin, while Mrs. Wilkin, on a camp stool by his side, rested a hand on his shoulder. Jip, it seemed, had got under her skin, too. Helen went over to speak to her, and I turned to her husband. Are you running a dog today, Mr. Wilkin? No, not this time. Just come to watch. I know a lot of the dogs. I stood near him for a while, watching the competitors in action breathing in the clean smell of trampled grass and plug tobacco. In front of us, next to the pen, the judge stood by his post. I had been there for about ten minutes when Mr. Wilkin lifted a pointing finger. Look who's there. George Crossley, with sweep, trotting at his heels, was making his way unhurriedly to the post. Jip suddenly stiffened and sat up very straight, his cocked ears accentuating the lopsided look. It was many months since he had seen his brother, and companion. It seemed unlikely, I thought, that he would remember him. But his interest was clearly intense, and as the judge waved his white handkerchief and the three sheep were released from the far corner, he rose slowly to his feet. A gesture from Mr. Crossley sent Sweep winging round the perimeter of the field in a wide, joyous gallop, and as he neared the sheep, a whistle dropped him on his belly. From then on, it was an object lesson in the cooperation of man and dog. Sep Wilkin had always said Sweep would be a champion, and he looked the part, darting and falling at his master's commands, short, piercing whistles, shrill, plaintive whistles. He was in tune with them all. No dog all day had brought his sheep through the three lots of gates as effortlessly as Sweep did now, and as he approached the pen near us it was obvious that he would win the cup unless some disaster struck. But this was the touchy bit. 
More than once with other dogs, the sheep had broken free and gone bounding away within feet of the wooden rails. George Crossley held the gate wide and extended his crook. You could see now why they all carried these long sticks. His commands to sweep, huddled flat along the turf, were now almost inaudible, but the quiet words brought the dog inching first one way, then the other. The sheep were in the entrance to the pen now, but they still looked around them irresolutely and the game was not over yet. But as Sweep wriggled towards them almost imperceptibly, they turned and entered, and Mr. Crossley crashed the gate behind them. As he did so, he turned to Sweep with a happy cry of, Good lad! And the dog responded with a quick jerking wag of his tail. At that, Jip, who had been standing very tall, watching every move with the most intense concentration, raised his head and emitted a single resounding bark. Ruff! went Jip, as we all stared at him in astonishment. Did you hear that? gasped Mrs. Wilkin. Well, by go! her husband burst out, looking open mouthed at his dog. Jip didn't seem to be aware that he had done anything unusual. He was too preoccupied by the reunion with his brother, and within seconds the two dogs were rolling around, chewing playfully at each other as of old. I suppose the Wilkins, as well as myself, had the feeling that this event might start Jip barking like any other dog. But it was not to be. Six years later I was on the farm and went to the house to get some hot water. As Mrs. Wilkins handed me the bucket, she looked down at Jip, who was basking in the sunshine outside the kitchen window. There you are, then, funny fella she said to the dog. I laughed. Has he ever barked since that day? Mrs. Wilkins shook her head. No, he hasn't. Not a sound. I waited a long time, but I know he's not going to do it now. Oh, well, it's not important. But still, I'll never forget that afternoon at the trial, I said. Nor will I. She looked at Jip again, and her eyes softened in reminiscence. Poor old lad. Eight years old and only one wolf. Chapter 7 Roy From Rags to Riches The silvery-haired old gentleman with the pleasant face didn't look the type to be easily upset, but his eyes glared at me angrily and his lips quivered with indignation. Mr. Harriet, he said, I have come to make a complaint. I strongly object to your callousness in subjecting my dog to unnecessary suffering. Suffering? What suffering? I was mystified. I think you know, Mr. Harriet. I brought my dog in a few days ago. He was very lame, and I am referring to your treatment on that occasion. I nodded, yes. I remember it well, but where does the suffering come in? Well, the poor animal is going round with his leg dangling and I have it on good authority that the bone is fractured and should have been put in plaster immediately. The old gentleman stuck his chin out fiercely. Yes, all right, you can stop worrying, I said. Your dog has a radial paralysis caused by a blow on the ribs, and if you're patient and follow my treatment, he'll gradually improve. In fact, I think he'll recover completely. But he trails his leg when he walks. I know. That's typical, and to the lame, and it does give the appearance of a broken leg. But he shows no sign of pain, does he? No. He seems quite happy, but this lady seemed to be absolutely sure of her facts. She was adamant. Lady? Yes, said the old gentleman. She is very clever with animals, and she came round to see if she could help in my dog's convalescence. She brought some excellent condition powders with her. Ah! A blinding shaft pierced the fog in my mind. All was suddenly clear. It was Mrs. Donovan, wasn't it? Well, um, yes, that was her name. Old Mrs. Donovan was a woman who really got around. No matter what was going on in Darby, weddings, funerals, house sales, you'd find the dumpy little figure and walnut face among the spectators, the darting, the black button eyes taking everything in, and always on the end of its lead, her terrier dog. When I say old, I'm only guessing because she appeared ageless. She seemed to have been around a long time, but she could have been anything between fifty-five and seventy-five. She certainly had the vitality of a young woman because she must have walked vast distances in her dedicated quest to keep abreast of events. Many people took an uncharitable view of her acute curiosity. But whatever the motivation, 
Her activities took her into almost every channel of life in the town. One of those channels was our veterinary practice. Because Mrs. Donovan, among her other widely ranging interests, was an animal doctor. In fact, I think it would be safe to say that this facet of her life transcended all the others. She could talk at length on the ailments of small animals, and she had a whole armory of medicines and remedies at her command, her two specialities being her miracle working condition powders and a dog shampoo of unprecedented value for improving the coat. She had an uncanny ability to sniff out a sick animal, and it was not uncommon when I was on my rounds to find Mrs. Donovan's dark, gypsy face poised intently over what I thought was my patient while she administered calf's foot jelly or one of her own patent nostrums. I suffered more than Siegfried because I took a more active part in the small animal side of our practice. I was anxious to develop this aspect and to improve my image in this field, and Mrs. Donovan didn't help at all. Young Miss Harriet, she would confide to my clients, is all right with cattle and such like, but he don't know nothing about dogs and cats. And, of course, they believed her and had implicit faith in her. She had the irresistible mystic appeal of the amateur, and on top of that, there was her habit, particularly endearing in Darby, of never charging for her advice, her medicines, her long periods of diligent nursing. Older folk in the town told how her husband, an Irish farm worker, had died many years ago, and how he must have had a bit put away because Mrs. Donovan had apparently been able to indulge all her interests over the years without financial strain. Since she inhabited the streets of Darby all day and every day, I often encountered her, and she always smiled up at me sweetly and told me how she had been sitting up all night with Mrs. So-and-so's dog that I'd been treating. She felt sure she'd be able to pull it through. There was no smile on her face, however, on the day when she rushed into the surgery while Siegfried and I were having tea. Miss Harriet! Can you come? My little dog's been run over. I jumped up and ran out to the car with her. She sat in the passenger seat with her head bowed, her hands clasped tightly on her knees. He slipped his collar and ran in front of a car, she murmured. He's lying in front of the school half up Cliff End Road. Please hurry. I was there within three minutes, but as I bent over the dusty little body stretched on the pavement, I knew there was nothing I could do. The fast glazing eyes, the faint, gasping respirations, the ghastly pallor of the mucous membranes all told the same story. I'll take him back to the surgery and get some saline into him, Mrs. Donovan. But I'm afraid he's had a massive internal hemorrhage. Did you see what happened exactly? She gulped. Yes. The wheel went right over him. Ruptured liver for sure. I passed my hands under the little animal and began to lift him gently. But as I did so, the breathing stopped and the eyes stared fixedly ahead. Mrs. Donovan sank to her knees and for a few moments she gently stroked the rough hair of the head and chest. He's dead, isn't he? She whispered at last. I'm afraid he is, I said. She got slowly to her feet and stood bewilderedly among the little group of bystanders on the pavement. Her lips moved, but she seemed unable to say any more. I took her arm, led her over to the car and opened the door. Get in and sit down. I'll run you home. Leave everything to me. I wrapped the dog in my carving overall and laid him in the boot before driving away. It wasn't until we drew up outside Mrs. Donovan's house that she began to weep silently. I sat there without speaking until she'd finished. Then she wiped her eyes and turned to me. Do you think he suffered at all? I'm certain he didn't. It was all so quick. He wouldn't know a thing about it. She tried to smile. Poor little Rex. I don't know what I'm going to do without him. We've travelled a few miles together, you know. Yes, you have. He had a wonderful life, Mrs. Donovan. And let me give you a bit of advice. You must get another dog. You'd be lost without one. She shook her head. No, I couldn't. That little dog meant too much to me. I couldn't let another take his place. Well, I know that's how you feel just now, but I wish you'd think about it. 
I don't want to seem callous. I tell everybody this when they lose an animal, and I know it's good advice. Mr. Harriet, I'll never have another one. She shook her head again, very decisively. Rex was my faithful friend for many years, and I just want to remember him. He's the last dog I'll ever have. I often saw Mrs. Donovan around the town after this, and I was glad to see she was still as active as ever, though she looked strangely incomplete without the little dog on its lead. But it must have been over a month before I had the chance to speak to her. It was on the afternoon that Inspector Halliday of the RSPCA rang me. Miss Darius, I'd like you to come to see an animal with me. A dog, and it's pretty grim. A dreadful case of neglect. He gave me the name of a row of old brick cottages down by the river and said he'd meet me there. Halliday was waiting for me, smart and businesslike, in his dark uniform, as I pulled up in the back lane behind the houses. He was a big, blonde man with cheerful blue eyes, but he didn't smile as he came over to the car. He's in here, he said, and led the way towards one of the doors in the long, crumbling wall. A few curious people were hanging around, and with a feeling of inevitability, I recognised a gnome-like brown face. Trust Mrs. Donovan, I thought, to be among those present at a time like this. We went through the door into the long garden. I had found that even the lowliest dwellings in Darby had long strips of land at the back, as though the builders had taken it for granted that the country people who were going to live in them would want to occupy themselves with the pursuits of the soil, with vegetable and fruit growing, even stock keeping in a small way. You usually found a pig there, a few hens, often pretty beds of flowers, but this garden was a wilderness. A chilling air of desolation hung over the few gnarled apple and plum trees standing among the tangle of rank grass. As though the place had been forsaken by all living creatures, Halliday went over to a ramshackle wooden shed with peeling paint and a rusted corrugated iron roof. He produced a key, unlocked the padlock, and dragged the door partly open. There was no window, and it wasn't easy to identify the jumble inside. Broken gardening tools, an ancient mangle, rows of flower pots, and partly used paint tins. And right at the back, a dog sitting quietly. I didn't notice him immediately. Because of the gloom, and because the smell in the shed started me coughing, but as I drew closer, I saw that he was a big animal, sitting very upright, his collar secured by a chain to a ring in the wall. I had seen some thin dogs, but this advanced emaciation reminded me of my textbooks on anatomy. Nowhere else did the bones of pelvis, face, and rib cage stand out with such horrifying clarity. A deep, smoothed-out hollow in the earth floor showed where he had lain. Moved about, in fact, lived for a very long time. The sight of the animal had a stupefying effect on me. I only half took in the rest of the scene: the filthy shreds of sacking scattered nearby, the bowl of scummy water. The hindquarters were a welter of pressure sores, which had turned gangrenous. There were similar sores along the sternum and ribs. The coat, which seemed to be a dull yellow, was matted and caked with dirt. The inspector spoke again. I don't think he's ever been out of here. He's only a young dog, about a year old, but I understand he's been in this shed since he was an eight-week-old pup. Somebody out in the lane heard a whimper, or he'd never have been found. I felt a tightening of the throat and a sudden nausea, which wasn't due to the smell. It was the thought of this patient animal sitting starved and forgotten in the darkness and filth for a year. I looked again at the dog and saw in his eyes only a calm trust. Some dogs would have barked their heads off and soon been discovered. Some would have become terrified and vicious. But this was one of the totally undemanding kind, the kind which had complete faith in people and accepted all their actions without complaint. Just an occasional whimper, perhaps, as he sat interminably in the empty blackness, which had been his world, and at times wondered what it was all about. Well, Inspector, I hope you're going to throw the book at whoever's responsible. I said. Halliday grunted. Ah,、oh, there won't be much done. It's a case of diminished responsibility. The owner's definitely simple. Lives with an aged mother. I've seen the fellow, and it seems he threw in a bit of food when he felt like it, and that's about all he did. They'll fine him and stop him keeping an animal in the future, but nothing more than that. I see. I reached out and stroked the dog's head, and he immediately responded by resting a paw on my wrist. 
There was a pathetic dignity about the way he held himself erect, the calm eyes regarding me, friendly and unafraid. Well, you'll let me know if you want me in court. Of course. And thank you for coming along. Halliday hesitated for a moment. And now I expect you'll want to put this poor thing out of his misery right away. I continued to run my hand over the head and ears while I thought for a moment. Yes, I suppose so. We'd never find a home for him in this state. It's the kindest thing to do. Anyway, push the door open wide, will you, so that I can get a proper look at him? In the improved light, I examined him more thoroughly. Perfect teeth. Well-proportioned limbs with a fringe of yellow hair. I put my stethoscope to his chest, and as I listened to the slow, strong thudding of the heart, the dog again put his paw on my hand. I turned to Halliday. You know, Inspector, inside this bag of bones is a lovely, healthy golden retriever. I wish there was some way of letting him out. As I spoke, I noticed there was more than one figure in the door opening. A pair of black, pebble eyes were peering intently at the big dog from behind the Inspector's broad back. The other spectators had remained in the lane, but Mrs. Donovan's curiosity had been too much for her. I continued conversationally as though I hadn't seen her. You know, what this dog needs first of all is a good shampoo to clean up his matted coat. Huh? said Halliday. Yes. And then he wants a long course of some really strong condition powders. What's that? The inspector looked startled. Now there's no doubt about it. It's the only hope for him. But where are you going to find such things? Really powerful enough, I mean. I sighed and straightened up. Oh, well, I suppose there's nothing else for it. I'd better put him to sleep right away. I'll get the things from my car. When I got back to the shed, Mrs. Donovan was already inside examining the dog, despite the feeble remonstrances of the big man. Look, she said excitedly, pointing to a name roughly scratched on the collar. His name's Roy. She smiled up at me. It's a bit like Rex, isn't it, that name? You know, Mrs. Donovan, now you mention it, it is. It's very like Rex, the way it comes off your tongue. I nodded seriously. She stood silent for a few moments, obviously in the grip of a deep emotion. Then she burst out. Can I have him? I can make him better. I know I can. Please, please let me have him. Well, I don't know, I said. It's really up to the inspector. You'll have to get his permission. Halliday looked at her in bewilderment. Then he said, Excuse me, madam. He drew me to one side. We walked a few yards through the long grass and stopped under a tree. Mr. Harriet, he whispered, I don't know what's going on, but I can't just pass over an animal in this condition to anybody who has a casual whim. The poor beggar's had one bad break already. I think it's enough. This woman doesn't look a suitable person. I held up a hand. Believe me, Inspector, you've nothing to worry about. She's a funny old stick, but she's been sent from heaven today. If anybody in Danaby can give this dog a new life, it's her. Halliday still looked very doubtful. But I still don't get it. What was all that stuff about him needing shampoos and condition powders? Oh, never mind about that. I'll tell you some other time. What he needs is a lot of good grub, care and affection, and that's just what he'll get. You can take my word for it. All right. You seem very sure. Halliday looked at me for a second or two, then turned and walked over to the eager little figure by the shed. I had never before been deliberately on the lookout for Mrs. Donovan. She had just cropped up wherever I happened to be, but now I scanned the streets of Danaby anxiously day after day without sighting her. I didn't like it when Gobber Newhouse got drunk and drove his bicycle determinedly through a barrier into a ten-foot hole where they were laying a new sewer, and Mrs. Donovan was not in evidence among the happy crowd who watched the council workmen and two policemen trying to get him out. And when she was nowhere to be seen, when they had to fetch the fire engine to the fish and chip shop the night the fat burst into flames, I became seriously worried. Maybe I should have called round to see how she was getting on with the dog. Certainly I had trimmed off the necrotic tissue and dressed the sores before she took him away. But perhaps he needed something more than that. And yet at the time I had felt a strong conviction 
but the main thing was to get him out of there and clean him and feed him and nature would do the rest. And I had a lot of faith in Mrs. Donovan, far more than she had in me, when it came to animal doctoring. It was hard to believe I'd been completely wrong. It must have been nearly three weeks and I was on the point of calling at her home when I noticed her stumping briskly along the far side of the marketplace, peering closely into every shop window exactly as before. The only difference was that she had a big yellow dog on the end of the lead. I turned the wheel and set my car bumping over the cobbles till I was abreast of her. When she saw me getting out, she stopped and smiled impishly, but she didn't speak as I bent over Roy and examined him. He was still a skinny dog, but he looked bright and happy. His wounds were healthy and granulating, and there wasn't a speck of dirt in his coat or on his skin. I knew then what Mrs. Donovan had been doing all this time. She had been washing and combing and teasing at that filthy tangle till she had finally conquered it. As I straightened up, she seized my wrist in a grip of surprising strength and looked up into my eyes. Now, Mr. Elliot, haven't I made a difference to this dog? You've done wonders, Mrs. Donovan. And you've been at him with that marvellous shampoo of yours, haven't you? She giggled and walked away. And from that day I saw the two of them frequently, but at a distance, and something like two months went by before I had the chance to talk to her again. She was passing by the surgery as I was coming down the steps, and again she grabbed my wrist. Miss Derrid, she said, just as she had done before. Haven't I made a difference to this dog? I looked down at Roy with something akin to awe. He had grown and filled out, and his coat, no longer yellow but a rich gold, lay in luxuriant, shining sways over the well-fleshed ribs and back. A new, brightly studied collar glittered on his neck, and his tail, beautifully fringed, fanned the air gently. He was now a golden retriever in full magnificence. As I stared at him, he reared up, plunked his forepaws on my chest and looked into my face, and in his eyes I read plainly the same calm affection and trust I had seen back in that black, noisome shed. Mrs. Donovan, he is the most beautiful dog in Yorkshire. Then, because I knew she was waiting for it, it's those wonderful condition powders. Whatever do you put in them? Ah, oh, wouldn't you like to know? She bridled and smiled up at me coquettishly and indeed she was nearer being kissed at that moment than for many years. I suppose you could say that that was the start of Roy's second life, and as the years passed I often pondered on the beneficent providence which had decreed that an animal which had spent its first twelve months abandoned and unwanted, staring uncomprehendingly into that unchanging, stinking darkness, should be whisked in a moment into an existence of light and movement and love. Because I don't think any dog had it quite so good as Roy from then on. His diet changed dramatically from odd bread crusts to best stewing steak and biscuit, meaty bones and a bowl of warm milk every evening. And he never missed a thing. Garden fates, school sports, evictions, gym carners, he'd be there. I was pleased to know that as time went on, Mrs. Donovan seemed to be clocking up an even greater daily mileage. Her expenditure on shoe leather must have been phenomenal. But of course, it was absolute pie for Roy. A busy round in the morning, home for a meal, then straight out again. It was all go. Mrs. Donovan didn't confine her activities to the town centre. There was a big stretch of common land down by the river, where there were seats, and people used to take their dogs for a gallop, and she liked to get down there fairly regularly to check on the latest developments on the domestic scene. I often saw Roy loping majestically over the grass among a pack of assorted canines, and when he wasn't doing that, he was submitting to being stroked or patted or generally fussed over. He was handsome, and he just liked people. It made him irresistible. It was common knowledge that his mistress had bought a whole selection of brushes and combs of various sizes with which she laboured over his coat. Some people said she had a little brush for his teeth, too. And it might have been true, but he certainly wouldn't need his nails clipped. His life on the roads would keep them down. Mrs. Donovan, too, had her reward. She had a faithful companion by her side every hour of the day and night. But there was more to it than that. She had always had the compulsion to help and heal animals, and the salvation of Roy was the high point of her life, a blazing triumph which never dimmed. 
I know the memory of it was always fresh because many years later I was sitting on the sidelines at a cricket match, and I saw the two of them, the old lady glancing keenly around her, Roy gazing placidly out of the field of play, apparently enjoying every ball. At the end of the match I watched them move away with the dispersing crowd. Roy would be about twelve then, and heaven only knows how old Mrs. Donovan must have been. But the big golden animal was trotting along effortlessly, and his mistress, a little more bent perhaps, and her head rather nearer the ground, was going very well. When she saw me, she came over, and I felt the familiar tight grip on my wrist. Mr. Elliot, she said, and in the dark, probing eyes, the pride was still as warm, the triumph still as burstingly new, as if it had all happened yesterday. Mr. Elliot. Haven't I made a difference to this dog? Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and we hope you enjoyed listening to your audiobook.